from the 60s, 1966, and today, actually, the presentation we bring to you is about historical repertoire, and we, what we do, as you could already notice, we reproduce this repertoire, but with the use of new technologies, if we can sum it up to one word. Uh, I'm therefore uh, very grateful to have Juan Parra here, who is uh, manipulating, as you can I think really well look over his shoulder what he's all doing on the computer. Um, why do I choose to perform solo here? This is part of my research project about um, the works in the 60s, how composers and also uh, many other artists are influenced by each other and what was actually the um, whole setup of technologies they had at the time and how we can nowadays validate those or ignore them or update their different uh, pathways to, to actually go there. Um, so as you could uh, notice, this work solo is a meant for one instrumentalist. Um, and what actually happens, so the original introduction to the score talks about uh, the following. I'm going to just read the instructions that are written in the score. So, solo composition for one instrumentalist may interpret it with any melody instrument. During performance, portions of what the instrumentalist plays are recorded on a two-channel tape machine. So we have to go back into the 60s where 
none of what you see today was actually available. Uh, through a feedback circuit, recorded sections are more or less densely superimposed, sometimes transparent, with a varied time delay. They'll play back over two speak speaker groups and then mixed in with the playing of the soloists. So you can imagine there was uh, this tape machine, uh, there were actually four assistants needed to make this uh, work performable. So um, what, we, what we just played, you can see, each one is actually taking care of all those people doing all those responsibilities, all those tasks in one. Um, a very important reason why I wanted to investigate about performance practice of this particular work, and I also have compared it with other works written in the 60s, like Procession for six players, um, is that it's all about the very important parameter of timbre. So in the uh, original score, there's four timbres that are described, and you could actually already uh, experience two of them played on flute, bass flute, so we have two timbres, but in that there's also lots of uh, intermingling with uh, rushing noises and percussive sounds, uh, very soft sounds, so it's up to the performer to decide upon these timbres, so this is not given by the composer, and uh, of course depends mostly on the instrument you play with, yeah? Um, so in these four, no this four timbres, which are very basically written as and for normal, and then one, two, and three for the other timbres you choose. Uh, a performer determines actually, uh, either on the same instrument or different instruments, uh, several timbres that might change over the duration of the score. Then, for what we in this performance now just did, is actually updating all this um, technical aspect of the piece. So with the tape machine and the feedback putting into a system uh, on computer. So, um, and what you also maybe have noticed, that we are following a strict timing. So that's why we would have to tune in at the start of the piece. And there's different, uh, what uh, Karl Heinz Stockhaus calls different form schemes, which you can choose from in this particular occasion we uh, chose uh, for scheme one, version one, which has a specific timing of 10 minutes 39,8 seconds. Uh, so, and um, what we um, would like to let you experience is trying to add even more of the timbre. So adding layers of timbre to what we just did by the use of a far different <laughs> communication, in this case, with people living in Australia. So maybe, Juan, if you yeah. could explain a bit Just about Very briefly, because also they, they have to go to another concert soon. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe we, we'll make the explanation very quick now and then we can oh, proceed yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So I just w uh, want to explain a little bit what's uh, uh, the setup now. The, what you heard before is the piece the way it was intentionally, uh, originally intended to be performed, and my take uh, when uh, updating or digitizing the, the setup was to, to create an experimental setting where we could allow current technology also to make a comment on the piece. And one of the, the things that, it, that, that if you see the history of, the, of this particular piece and the recordings, again, going a little bit in connection with the with this idea of, of challenging the Bergtrauer or the final work that, that Nico was talking about, uh, is that in every recording of this piece, sanctioned by the composer, there's an adding of elements that are not being produced by the solo instrument and the delay system. And those elements are in, in particular sections of the piece where more timbre variety or timbre density is what the required. So my take is to bring network technology and what it allows us to do is to basically disassociate the performer that is playing live with its sound, the sound that he's being produ producing. So what we're doing here is that both now 
uh, Lindsay Bickery, who's a, 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 a third and assisted by Josh Mulder, they will be performed uh, simultaneously with uh, Karim, the piece, but I will be opening and closing his signal into the delay system, so I will be deciding when what he is contributing actually is heard by, by us. So it's a way of creating the same setup that happened in the studio in the recording where Stockhausen decided, oh, okay, in this section I need to add tape parts from other pieces, but in a live concert situation. And that's something that is possible thanks to network technology. Yeah, I think there's something very similar to what we heard Nico uh, uh, talking about, that the composer can be either really satisfied with the performance or say something is missing or it's not what I expected it to be. So that happened a lot with uh, music by Stockhausen. I, we was working in the studio and then asking things for musicians and trying to find ways to add uh, extra layers especially in, in acousmatic music, I would say. So let's first perform uh, a second version of the same piece. We will definitely recognize some of the material that we played in our first performance. Can you get an A for us? Yeah, let's play an A.
uh, stay prepared to get to their concert. It's <laughs> evening there now. Um, I think it would be interesting to talk a bit more about the uh, whole compositional aspect of this piece and exactly the restrictions that are given to the performer uh, in playing this piece. So, um, first of all, when you are presented with a score like this, a solo, you have to make your own version. So that's the first thing. There's basically six pages where you choose your sound material from. So that can be small fragments like two notes. It can be a whole line, just some repetition of one note, things you probably have recognized me doing in the two versions. Um, so that's the starting point. And you think that, like after a while, uh, you, you get a bit of fun out of just choosing material. But then when you get together and start rehearsing, and so you hear your material is then refiltered and um, uh, played back, but completely changed, or maybe there is some, some little things that are taken out and come back in reverse mode, etc. Uh, you then, as a performer, you start thinking, well, maybe my material wasn't that interesting after all. So you, in my case, I ended up getting rid of lots of what I originally chose and made a new version. Then we came back again together. And this is a, an ongoing process. And it's almost as if you are there at, on, at the desk with the composer, just thinking, how can you make this version work? So uh, for people who want to investigate, there are many different recordings of this particular piece, solo, uh, not only for flute, but also for synthesizer, trombone, um, really very uh, interesting comparable version. Um, so what we've done now in this second performance, you could say, okay, one musician is added, playing the same piece, solo, the same time structure, the same pr procedure of going through the material and choose how you will have uh, your version played. But then there is, of course, um, for Juan, a very important part of the score, which maybe we can show it a bit on the on the scheme, on the paper, is actually the, the four actions the assistants originally had to do, which was deciding where to have a delay in the tape and where to have a repetition or shortcut it or all those actions, really physical actions that we now uh, make digitally. Uh, so can I maybe intercede? Yeah. Just a brief comment because yeah. uh, if uh, you might know the piece already, and, and if you do, you might also know that, that uh, there are many digital versions uh, of this setup for, to allow uh, a real uh, soloist to perform on his or her own. And uh, the reason behind not doing that, although it's fairly trivial to uh, digitally automatize everything, is basically because once we start with a collaborative process, we realize that actually there's a lot of information there that is more akin to traditional instrumental performance in terms of making choices and, and, and deciding on the spot how, how far or how slow each one of the instructions need to be carried out. And uh, my personal experience when analyzing other digital versions that were more automatic, basically, where all the opening and closing of the gates are time is that it, it basically creates something that is perhaps good for practicing, but it loses a lot when it comes to, to a performance situation. There's a lot of nuances that get completely lost. Yeah, and that's what exactly we wanted to keep. This is respect of the tradition and the, the live performance uh, aspect of trying things out and uh, being really involved together in the whole process. So I think we have to stop here. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah.